Hi everyone, it's not Dave Ghoul anymore, it's the Black Goats Gang, since I've already changed my name by the time I made this video. Uh, I wanted, before I, we start this video, I wanted to, to just give uh, a little thank you for all of you guys who, um, uh, who actually supported the change. Uh, I really appreciate that, so thank you. Um, and today I bring you guys uh, a very interesting video. I've had the idea for for making uh, a tier list, uh, a Tokyo Ghoul tier list uh, for a while and ever since I made the openings ranked video I've been wanting to specifically uh, focus on the, to uh, the Tokyo Ghoul arcs which is definitely uh, a great point of conversation there Tokyo Ghoul has some of, in my opinion, some of the best arcs uh, in manga and yeah um, so, uh, heads up, this is going to be specifically focused on ma uh, the Tokyo Ghoul manga and not uh, the anime, since not only I think the manga uh, has the most context about these arcs, the anime leaves out uh, very important, I would say very crucial things, and it also doesn't, um, doesn't adapt uh, faithfully the manga 100%. I think Rude is the best example of that. So, in order to make things easier, um, I went, uh, you know, I'm actually going to to go off uh, the source material. So, Suishida's original work. So, uh, well, the way that this is, uh, that I'm gonna do this, so we have um, the, the greatest category. Uh, the highest praised category, uh, which is the masterpiece level. Uh, this is the category for every arc that I consider to be just absolutely flawless, uh, where I don't have any issues with. I think it's it's Tokyo Ghoul at, at its best, basically. The almost perfect category, all of these uh, those arcs that were very, very close into being just masterpieces, but they... They, they, was, they didn't quite get there. The very good category, which is, it, again, it's still very great arcs, do a lot of great things, but they're, you know, they're not some of the best in the entirety of the story. Um, and at that we have the alright category, where it, those are, these are the arcs where I think, you know, there's still good things about them, but the execution starts to be a little bit more clumsy, uh, in my opinion. And then, of course, we have the at the very bottom, the worst category, uh, which I think I don't need to, to really explain myself. So yeah, uh, let's start, uh, shall we? Uh, so yeah, I'm incredibly excited to do this. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's just start. So firstly, we have the introduction arc, which is, of course, the very first arc of the story, and this is where we get introduced to uh, Ken Kaneki and his whole story. We get introduced to the ghouls and and the CCG and this whole world and mythology. And yeah, I think you know it's it's very good. You know, I've I've I don't know if I will put it in the almost perfect category. If I'm being honest, I think again there's a lot of good things in the introduction arc, and again it's it's the one that uh, kickstarts the whole thing. But uh, again, it's very good. It's it's a very good introduction, very solid introduction. But again, in comparison to all of the other arcs that that followed, I think you know, you know, I think there's a lot of more great things to come. So um, I think this is a nice spot to to start off the. Um, all of the arcs. So the second arc, the Nishiki arc, which goes from chapter 4 to 9, uh, the introduction arc only branching out to three chapters. Um, this was also, you know, pretty good. Um, again, we get to, to see a little bit of an expansion of what we got in, in the introduction arc. Um, again, Nishiki, it's still, 
you know, is the major focus on this arc, of course, obviously. And, you know, uh, we get much more about uh, about his character in the gourmet arc, so in hindsight, yeah, um, you know, he becomes a much more interesting character. But it's truly, again, the focus is still on Kaneki, very much on Kaneki and Hide, and again, Kaneki and Hide's relationship is such an interesting one, and unfortunately, we don't get a lot of that, uh, not just in the manga, but in the anime as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is one of those arcs where we really get to see just not not just Kaneki's in a struggle, which of course we got a lot in the introduction arc, but he is just how important he is to him as well. And, and yeah, there there's some really cool stuff in the Nishiki arc as well. Again, setting all setting all up, uh, everything up. So the uh, next we have the Dove's Emergence arc that goes from chapter 10 to 30. This of course is the whole arc that focuses on Inami. Um, um, and their family that focuses on uh, as well Toka's a little bit of Toka's uh, own character and and Kaneki's relation with uh, Toka and obviously uh, I think the most uh, important aspect of the entire arc um, the introduction of the CCG the Doves and and of course uh, the character of Mado and Amon um, again very early stages but it the things that it does, that Suishida does in this arc are just, again, very, very well done, um, I would say. We really get a lot of, we start to see a lot of the complexity of this world, you know, and just how, again, complex and, and you know, and not just one-dimensional conflict that 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 we have between the humans and the cults and we also see Kaneki's old we start to see Kaneki's old position amongst it you know the the realization his realization that he's the only one who can uh who can understand both the human world and the ghoul world which you know is just awesome and and again is this is where we start to see um Kaneki and Amon's own uh relation you know and the the very a complicated relation between the two uh, and also the the whole thing you know with Toka I think it, it we start to see a lot of her character progression in in this arc and <clears throat> and we see just that you know characters like Mado that seem very one-dimensional and all that uh, just like a lot of the ghouls there's much more to his character as well and of course that leads to a very interesting storyline um, after this arc, uh, a little bit more down down the road in the first part, um, but yeah, still very solid arc as well. So <laughs> next one we have the gourmet arc. Now, even though I do pref I do think the Dove's Emergence arc is not just more. There's a lot more to chew on with with uh, the arc in specific. Um, I still prefer the the gourmet arc over the Dove's arc just because Tsukuyama, I mean, is one of the best characters in, in the whole story. And even though he gets much more explored as a character uh, later down the road, uh, specifically in Re, um, again, it, I think it was he was a great villain at the time uh, for Kaneki, and again, it was just so entertaining. I, you know, I just love the whole uh, serial killer vibe about him and and the very you know disgusting and and <laughs> creepy uh relation between him and, and kaneki is just just awesome uh yeah so now we get to uh probably one of the best and we'll see if it's the best arc in the whole story which is the Augury Tree slash 11th Ward Battle Arc, which goes from chapter 47 to 79. Yeah, to me there is, you know, just no doubt, this is a masterpiece. Um, this was officially, this was the arc that made me love Tokyo Ghoul. You know, the, beforehand, beforehand I loved, uh, I, I already, I was really enjoying Tokyo Ghoul, uh, and a lot of its themes and all that, but, you know, just like in the anime, once this arc started, and specifically uh, Kaneki's torture started, um, 
and we get to see a lot of this, you know, Swiss Sheeda's way of, of portraying the psychology of Kaneki to its extreme. We get to know a little bit more about Kaneki's past and, and how he became the person that he is and just how much his ideology and philosophy was affected by, you know, by his mother and how it actually is keeping him from being able to to protect Antiku and I mean there's so much greatness in this arc uh, but again that moment alone I think it makes the arc and and the, the the outcome of it you know finally seeing Kaneki you know fighting and finally standing for himself and and for for the ones that he loves and in him leaving Antiku and uh, his decision to in order to to protect Antiku to distance himself from them and create his own team it's just you know awesome stuff awesome stuff indeed so now we have the lab no not the laboratory the post augury tree slash time skip arc uh, that goes from chapter 80 to 94 again to me still in the masterpiece area continuing the greatness the end uh the greatness of the of the last arc and the incredible ending, the incredible resolution for, for that arc. Um, not just we see more of Kaneki, wider Kaneki, which is, you know, he's such a fucking badass. And I mean, when I saw for, for when I read for the first time uh, Kaneki's and, and Ayoto's fight, because I'd seen the anime first and the anime failed miserably to portray just how savage and ruthless Kaneki could be as white hair. I mean, even though I made a video uh, highlighting why Black Reaper is stronger than, uh, is the most powerful person, one of the most powerful, but more powerful uh, than white hair. I mean, white hair is still, I think, the most savage, for sure. I mean, the way that he treats Ayato, Damn, you know, and the way that Suishida portrays portrays it all through the art is just absolutely insane. And of course, Kaneki getting his revenge on on the auction, you know, the the ghouls on the auction, uh, uh, mirroring, you know, his, you know, more of his situation when he was the prey in the gourmet arc. Um, and you know, and also we get a lot of. Uh, a lot more about the CCG and a lot of its characters. We get uh, the introduction of Akira, and and we get much more about Amon as well as the characters. So there's a lot, a lot of greatness here. So yeah, this is just absolutely amazing. So now we have the laboratory raid arc that goes from chapter 95 to 107. Um, I'm gonna be, you know, I'm, sh I'm I struggle a little bit between it being very good and all right um i think for now i'm gonna put it in the all right if i'm gonna be honest with you because again even though there's a lot of great things about this this specific arc that that i love uh we do get the the Kochile, uh, uh assault which you know it's just great and we see kaneki losing more of his mind as well um the whole laboratory part uh, and also we get a lot of more about Juzo as a character which is always great you know Juzo is one of the best characters of the entire story um, but the I mean I think the name says it all the laboratory part of it um, the Kano's old section uh, and the whole section in the mansion although I liked the implications of it especially regarding Rize um, there was a lot of mystery there that you know I wanted to know, generally wanted to know the, the answers for. Um, a lot of it's execution, I don't know, it just, I liked it, I still liked it, but I guess I had much bigger expectations, especially for Kano's character, and unfortunately Ri wasn't able to, to, really, um, to really change much about that, about his character. You know, he, he was very much the mad scientist, you know, he was playing the mad scientist part and he wasn't really, you know, and I thought that we will fix this, but it really didn't, you know, Kano ended up being a very one dimensional character and I don't know, I, you know, seeing Kaneki finally confront Kano, the person who transformed him, 
the way that he was, you know, into a half human, half ghoul. I was expecting much more, you know, with with both of them. You know, I thought it was going to be a very important part in the world story, and it ended up not, you know, being the not going the way that I thought it would. And um, again, I thought expectation-wise, I thought there was a lot of potential here that you know wasn't met, and you know, maybe that's why it. You know, I think it's one of the the, no, it's really the weakest arc in the entire part one. But again, it's still it's still good, you know. I, I'm struggling between very good and all right. Maybe when when I see the other arcs, I'll I'll put it a little bit higher. But for now, I'll put it in the all right. So now we have the disbanding arc uh, that goes from chapter one eight to one hundred twenty one. Um, I would put it in very good. Yeah, I think. Um, it's really a transition arc. Um, there's, you know, not many major things happening in this arc. Again, like the name says, uh, this is the arc where Kaneki uh, disbands the team, um, the team composing Banjo, um, Tsukuyama, Inami not, but Inami was also, you know, she, she visited them once in a while. Um, yeah, I, uh, but, you know, not just that, there are also very cool stuff like uh, Yomo's old backstory, which I really appreciated. Uh, and we, we not only we get more about Yomo, but we see just how uh, ver how similar he was to Kaneki and why Yomo does have a, a soft spot for Kaneki specifically because he reminds him uh, a lot of him. And um, you know, uh, and also we get to to see Rize that you know. Uh, following the laboratory arc, we see Rize, uh, Rize is actually alive, and and I mean that panel where we is, we see Kaneki's reaction towards Rize, and Rize just not, you know, not having any conscience at all, just being this, you know, just having this, uh, this hunger that she can't uh, satiate. It's you know it's. It's the stuff of nightmares, really, and the way that Tsushida portrays that moment is just incredible. So, again, really, this is a transition, more of a transition arc. There's some cool, really cool stuff, but again, it's it really paves the way for the final arc in part one, which I think there is no doubt that it's also a, a masterpiece. Um, it really, and actually, I think it's between uh, the Augury arc and the Owl Suppression Operation arc. That goes from chapter 122 to 142 plus the epilogue. And yeah, um, what can I say about the all suppression arc? Um, even though I enjoyed a lot of what they did in Rude, um, I mean, the way that Sushida wraps this arc is just brutal. I mean, everything that happens to Kaneki uh, in those final chapters is fight again Arima. And, and the whole resolution of that of that arc. I remember because I watched Rude first, and I remember when I was when I decided to read the manga afterwards. I was just shocked to see just how different things played out. And honestly, you know, Kaneki's fate, I wasn't expecting it all at all. You know, it was a huge shock. I never expected because again, Kaneki's the protagonist. You know, this story is about him. You know, the story doesn't work if you don't have Kaneki. And I was like what do they do next after this you know i was i was salivating for more you know i really wanted to know what happened afterwards in in re you know and how they continue the story after afterwards and uh, and so yeah there's so much greatness and of course the iconic scene between kaneki and arima with the white flowers and it's just the stuff of legend for sure uh, there's nothing and the way that it builds towards the climax and the emotion behind it is just incredible. And of course, we see Eto as well, finally uh, transforming into into the the One Eye Owl and all of that. It's just amazing. So um, finally, we get to Re, and we start with the Torso Investigation Arc that goes from Chapter One to Seven. Again, I would say it's a very good arc. Um, actually. Generally speaking, I think not just the art style, I think improved greatly uh, on Sushi this part. I also think his way of starting out um, a whole new story. I also thought, I actually think the way that restarts is much more solid than the way that the first part starts. I think Sushi definitely improved quite a lot. 
Um, I love the introdu introduction of the Quink Squad as well. Love all of the, the new characters. And, and yeah, really solid arc. We get to see uh, Heise. Of course, we suspect uh, about Heise at first a little bit. Um, but um, but yeah, I love the, his whole character. I love the little details that unfortunately the anime didn't adapt uh, for when it comes to his character. And we also see remnant, remnants of Kaneki as well with his character. Um, um, which they also didn't adapt into the anime, unfortunately. Again, I, I guess I, you know, I love the detail, the little details that Suishida planted in the story before. But I think it, it's really in Re, at least the beginning of Re, that, you know, it's just it's very refined. I think his writing is is very very refined, and yeah, I think the start of Re is it's actually more powerful than and much more well executed than. Um, the first part of Tokyo Ghoul, but but again, it's still I think I would still put them on on the same you know the same level. So now we have uh, the Nutcracker invest the Nutcr <laughs> Nutcracker investigation arc, which goes from chapter eight to thirty one. Because I've actually I'm actually gonna put this one and the auction arc together. Uh, I will, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put them as the same arc, really, you know, they're, they're very much the same arc, um, and yeah, again, very good, I love the stuff, a lot of the stuff that, that is done in this specific arc, so, uh, I actually think the manga does it better than the anime, because I remember when I was watching the anime at first, the first time, and I was getting a little bit, you know, uh, I wasn't as thrilled about the arc because it, it really, for the most part, it felt like something we'd seen before. We'd seen this, you know, it was f starting to feel a little bit repetitive. We'd seen this kind of thing before in, in the Tokyo Ghoul story and, it, you know, it felt very formulaic and I was expecting for Suishida to change that a little bit. Uh, which ro the Rose arc was still very much the same formula, but it was still able because of the characters and the implications, um, it was able to spice a little bit things up. But I I do think that in the manga, um, again the details really matter really, and um, I think in the manga that Suishida was able to 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 make it much more interesting. I think much more unique. Uh, but yeah. So next we have the Rose arc, which I'm also gonna put. Um, the Tsukuyama family extermination operation arc with uh, the Rose investigation arc which goes from chapter 32 to 59 with the two of them combined and yeah this is I, I think <clears throat> you know I don't know you know almost perfect I think I'm gonna yeah I think I'm gonna put it in a, as a masterpiece um, I have no flaws with this arc I think not only do you get more characters introduced, uh, like I've said before, Tsukuyama is much more well explored. Um, I mean, so much greatness happens in this, in these two arcs, and I mean, just the whole section with Black Reaper um, and Heise's transform, uh, you know, and Kaneki's awakening, Heise's transformation back. Uh, towards Kaneki, I just, I mean, again, stuff of legend, you know, he, Kaneki's battle with Eto, um, you know, the aftermath of that as well, you know, we see a little bit of Black Reaper, even though I wanted to see a little bit more of Black Reaper, especially uh, his, Kaneki's and, and Eto's uh, interactions, I wanted to see more of that, um, it was still, you know, just solid stuff, and again, one of my all-time favorite moments again it's is Heise um, coming to the realization that he needs to bring Kaneki back um, and I just I love that I love it. I love Heise's journey in Re but yeah it's just amazing so now we have again I an almost perfect arc you know the um, the third god Shilia raid slash the Rushima landing operation arc uh, that goes from chapter 60 to 98. Um, if this arc consisted only um, about, you know, Arima and Kaneki's old fight, um, and the whole Kuchila section, 
uh, I will have put this definitely in a, as a masterpiece. But uh, since um, it also consists on Rishima arc, again, a lot of great stuff in, in the Rishima um, assault uh, portion of the story. You know, we get to see the Quink Squad, the new Quink Squad, uh, Quink Squad operating. We see Amon back, which is awesome. Um, we and of course I think the highlight of the Rushima section is uh, Toru's old arc. I love, I just love the revelation of her character. And I actually, after reading the manga, um, I was actually pissed at the anime. And I can only imagine manga readers when when they saw it being done in in, in the anime. I mean, the whole second part of Re just wasn't able. They took a lot out. They took a lot of the Black Reaper out as well. Um, I mean, I remember I was reading the manga. I was just shocked about Toru's old revelation. I did not expect that. And it made her such a fascinating character, such a much more fascinating character, and and she actually became one of my favorites. It, 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 that's one of my favorite all-time favorite moments, not just in Re, but in all of the story. And again, the whole Kaneki and Arima confrontation are just absolutely incredible. You know, Kaneki finally, you know, turning to white hair again, although this time around, he doesn't see himself just as the pawn anymore. He's, he's finally able to become a king, the one-eye king, and, and his interaction with Ide, which I thought should have been uh, their last interaction. Um, but again, Suishida was still able to do some interesting stuff with Hide afterwards, but uh, I thought that was the perfect resolution for, for Kaneki and Hide's old journey. But again, such emotion there, so many incredible things, but again, a lot of the rest of Ru the Rushima arc, uh, the Rushima section, it was good, but again, if it, it was on the same level as everything else, I will definitely put it in a masterpiece, but but oh well. So the next one, we have the Cloud Siege slash CCG lab infiltration arc that goes from chapter 99 to 116. Um, I thought, again, it was almost perfect. I think this was, this was still when um, Suishida was setting up a lot of very interesting things. Um, a lot of incredible moments, but again, still not a masterpiece because we start to see a little bit of the cracks uh, with Switch again, uh, even though we, you know, we know the context behind it, and you know, it still is, it still is a shame, you know, because there was a lot of potential in the arcs after. Uh, but it, it, there's still a lot of great moments here. We, I mean, the iconic scene with Toka and Kaneki, which, fun fact, Switch should actually draw. The whole scene by himself. He didn't want the staff to to do it. That scene, so that was uh, great. Um, such a great moment in in the story. Uh, also, we get finally Akira Inami and Toka's whole confrontation, which was just incredible. Especially when you know the story behind uh, the inspiration for for that scene. Um, that sushi they had, and. Uh, also, Amon and Kaneki finally interacting again and finally understanding each other, being able to, to talk as equals, which is just, you know, on the same level of understanding, which I just, I, I love. Um, although, unfortunately, again, Amon, you know, Su Sushida wouldn't do much with Amon uh, afterwards, which was a real shame, but uh, that was still a, a highlight moment for sure. So yeah, you know, there's a lot of great stuff here for sure. Um, before we get to uh, some of the the weakest um, the weakest arcs. Now I'm still gonna put the the 24th Ward Raid uh, that goes from chapter 117 and 143 uh, at the very good category. Even though, again. This is where we start to see the cracks opening. A lot of the things that Suishida has, has set up, we start to see him rushing a little bit, the payoff. Um, yes, we get... Re I think what really saves, uh, you know, there's still a lot of incredible moments. We have, of course, Kaneki versus Suzuya, even though it was cut short a little bit. Uh, we get the wedding between Kaneki and Toka, which was also awesome. Uh, we get a lot of cool stuff, but again, 
uh, the pacing is all has some issues. Um, things start to you know again the cracks start to to opening up a little bit, which is unfortunate. But I I still think it's a very good arc. Uh, but yeah, if if the last arc, which is the dragon arc, uh, spoiler alert, if it, it was better, uh, I definitely will have put this uh, much higher if it was able to pay off a lot of the things that was set up before but unfortunately again the lead up to dragon was awesome uh, but you know I think the again the whole dragon arc if it was better I would have definitely bumped this up um, so yeah so finally we get to the dragon arc um, definitely a masterpiece for sure, you know, no, no questions. Um, honestly, again, uh, if you guys have been following my channel for a while, you know, I wasn't the biggest fan of, of the Dragon Arc, even though I've, the manga does give a lot more context to it, and there's much more that is fleshed out in the arc. The anime did a, an abominable, uh, job at, um, at fleshing out the dragon arc like m most of the other arcs as well uh, leading up to this one um, but um, yes even reading the manga I still think it wasn't it was by far the weakest arc of the entire storyline unfortunately uh, which is a shame because there's some awesome moments here Furuta is much more fleshed out. We get to know much more him as a as an antagonist, which in the anime we had nothing at all with this character. Uh, we get to see Kaneki's whole interaction with Rize, paralleling his moment with Rize uh, at the you know in the Auguri arc, which was fantastic. Uh, we see, of course, uh, Kaneki and having to kill Rize at the end, and it actually like the. Um, like the the arc um the third cochilio raid arc where we see kaneki um interacting with ide um one of my favorite lines is 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 from it is you know um um just live you know i love that line it's one of my best lines in the one of my favorite lines in all of tokyo cool and the dragon arc has some of one of my all-time favorite lines that mirrors um, the the Kaneki's line about his life being, a, if it was the protagonist, his life being a tragedy. And I love the parallelism where you have Kaneki saying that um, everyone life, everyone is the protagonist of their own story, and 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 so he, you know, his life is not the only tragedy. I love how much just how much we see Kaneki has evolved as a character through that line and the humility that he gains as well just awesome um uh, unfortunately the anime didn't adapt that line because uh, they didn't have the initial line uh, in the first season as well uh, again a lot of great stuff but at the same time a lot of the other characters resolutions weren't as great uh, i didn't think um they were very, you know, very repetitive. A lot of it felt, honestly, really, I hate to say this, but it, it felt like a shonen kind of story, you know, and it, it's really jarring when you compare it to everything else in Tokyo Ghoul. Tokyo Ghoul is such an interesting and different kind of uh, kind of story, and to have this final arc play things so safe. Even Suishida admitted this himself, you know, playing safe, because he just didn't... He just didn't have the time, you know, the time that he set for himself being six months. He just needed to play things more safe, you know. He, he needed to rush things up. And and the arc really suffered for it. Even though, again, I respect his a lot of his decisions. And and it he does stick at the very end with the happy ending. I wish that he took more risks with this. And again i don't really i don't mind kaneki surviving at the end at all but i wish that there will have been more sacrifices i think it will have benefited more i mean it's such a dark story such as tokyo ghoul to at the very end the most important um 
the most important event, hap event happening in the Tokyo Ghoul story, and you don't, you know, you have every major character surviving. For example, I think Inami should have uh, died in in the in the last arc, but she didn't. Uh, I think a lot of other characters shouldn't have made it out alive, <clears throat> but but yeah, you know, it does take a little bit away. Uh, it, it, it cheapens a little bit the victory and I also didn't like the resolution of the whole conflict between the CCG and, and the ghouls. I thought that again it was very it was very rushed and very forced. I think it, it was it didn't feel natural uh, like the Akira realization uh, towards Inami and Toka's old story uh, felt that moment felt really. So yeah, but again, it's an alright, I think there are enough moments here that save it in the end, but it's still definitely the weakest uh, out, of the, out of all of the arcs. So let me just, give me just a second to order this and I'll get right back to you. Alright, here we go. So it, everything is ordered, everything is, is polished, so of course my opinion might change in the future. Uh, especially because, especially with part one, uh, there's it's been a very long time since I've read uh, part one. Uh, I've actually reread more re uh, because I've been collecting the volumes. So yeah, so uh, I may change this. It's not a definitive list. Like the openings might not be definitive as well. But but yeah, um, for now this is it. This is my this is my list. Um, I think again, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of greatness here in the Tokyo Ghoul story. Some flaws, of course, it's not perfect, but it's still it changed my life uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I love a lot of the characters. I love a lot of the story elements. I love a lot the world, and and yeah, there's some really incredible arcs here, and yeah. So yeah, I had a lot of fun making this. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and yeah. Uh, I'll see you in the next one. Um, thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed this as much as I, I enjoyed making this. And yeah, ciao, matane.